more time has always been one of the games I always come back to, and with very good reason. The game is quite hard to master and it takes a long time to be able to confidently navigate the quarters of more time. As you start out, you will suffer. You will suffer a lot. Because you quickly find out that this game is relentlessly unforgiving for unexperienced players. You can work for hours, polish and name your warbands, but in a heartbeat you may end up losing henchmen or heroes you've been training for so long. And it reflects in the comments on Steam. People hating the RNG, calling it unfair. It's actually really not. It's tough, it's definitely not unfair. So let me teach you, before you fail, so you can enjoy the game just like I do. And if you wonder who are you to teach me, well look at my latest warband. 43 missions, success 100%, 1 crushing, 22 tactical and rest battleground victories. 0 permadeaths, 0 injuries, like limbs missing. The warband is nearly level 9, has 1 leader, 1 impressive, 4 hero slots, 5 henchmen and 5 reserve slots. The race is undead. You can choose 6 starting races, provided you have the DLCs. First you have the human mercenaries and the witch hunters, which are a solid starting band without too much speciality. They have a combination of ranged and melee and a little magic later on. And then you have the paladin like sisters, they are a female only holy warrior band, with heavy melee and tank capabilities. As well as a lot of buffing and healing later on. The cult of the possessed with dark arch and high dps melee fighters. The brutal skaven, one of my personal favorites, a combination of melee and range with poison armaments and spells. And then the undead, which I'm currently playing, a heavy melee warband with terror and necromancy. So let's get back to the current warband. First you have the leader, and it may be advised to make a backup leader for when something happens to your leader, but I didn't. Well, initially I did, and then I got rid of it, as it was still level 0 after like 20 matches, and I needed the reserve slots. The leader is vast and powerful warrior, and the warband cannot fight without it. As your warband progresses, you can recruit up to 4 heroes. Heroes can almost match the leader in power when trained, and together they form the heart of your warband. Heroes can vary as class, but you often find a caster among them, unique to that type of warband. For the undead, that's a necromancer. If you played some races and you have unlocked some DLCs, you could eventually use heroes from other warbands. This can also be done with reputation, but I will explain that later. And I did. I took a Skaven Poison Globadier, who really carried my early game. Having a heavy frontline, I could pin a number of enemies down in an alley or place and then rain down poison on their positions while taking minimal damage. The caster is a necromancer and being all evil he can learn several spells, including life stealing, making it a formidable foe. But casters have a weakness, called Shainter Curse. If they cast, they can debuff or even kill themselves, especially on low level. Luckily mine did knock himself out several times on low level, but never got any serious injuries or permadeath. Other heroes might be to support the leader, for example the ranged drag has a skill called Humble Servant, used to heal the vampires from a range. You can either build those heroes into a tank or a ranged, since Undead Belly has any, this might actually be somewhat beneficial. Then you have the henchmen, and usually you can split them as a frontline and a backline. For example the Skaven have the Warp Guards, wear heavy armor, a helmet and a shield, and they form a very sturdy frontline that can take much punishment. For tanks with a shield you usually focus on the parry ability. This skill is found on the martial and is called weapon skill. The other type of henchman is for Skaven, the Vermenkin, and usually use a ranged as primary weapon. You focus on the ballistic skill, or if you don't build them ranged you can consider accuracy. Either type can be built with melee weapons. This does not count for all races, for example the Undead and Sisters of Sigmar cannot build any ranged units. For Undead, the zombie is the tanky one and can build toughness, afterwards strength and weapon skill. But the ghoul cannot wield ranged or shield or armor or a helmet, so you build them into dodgers. Max out agility first, the henchman will need a dodge of 95 or more. Please, as a side note, understand this, these percentages are somewhat misleading. 95 is the max you can have in combat for dodge, for parry, for everything, but that doesn't mean you dodge or parry 95% of the time. Weapon skill, dodge bypass and search of the enemy must be held in account too. But it does give you a very good chance to dodge, especially versus enemies with a low weapon skill or two-handed weapon. Last, but best, the impressive. The impressive is mainly impressive in size, so you must level it and it takes time. Seeing you only get him later in the game, this might become pretty tricky. 
as a low level massive fluff of meat will easily be shredded by high level enemy impressives or champions. It has vastly improved health, which is obtained from toughness and is called wounds in the game, and also decent damage. It usually takes two of the best fighters to take a strong impressive out, with a real risk of permanent injuries or death. Finding one away from their troops can prove a lucky coincidence. It's a bit tricky to recruit, but once you can, you empty all slots of a triangle, and then you can put the impressive in the top slot, if your warband level is high enough. It should be around 5. There's also a paragon called a Dramatis Personae, who goes along with your ACT campaign missions. You can see it standing in the home screen by veteran missions, but you cannot level or interact with it. Talking about the veteran system, every achievement you achieve counts towards veteran experience. This can help you unlock a powerful head start for your newer warbands, the passing increase of the veteran level pertains mostly to hiring higher level troops, buying and selling prizes and some money bonuses to start, as well as an extra mission on the mission map on higher levels. But every level you also get a skill point to increase veteran skills, ideal for boosting the warband just a little. For example, the commander perk, increased twice, will pretty decently reduce the cost of almost all expensive heroes. Also, the Scholar skill can save some decent money. Many others either give a small boost in buying, selling, healing or are contact skills, allowing you to have a chance to gain free items every day. It should be relatively easy to get to level 4 pretty fast. Now let's go back to the Warband. First you have your Warband rank, mainly increased by completing missions. And the higher the Warband rank, the more troops you can hire. The more resistances you get to Weirdstone, capacity of your card and all alone tests. An all alone test triggers when a warrior is alone and two or more enemies surround him. This can be used heavily to isolate an enemy. If they fail the test and can move backwards, they attempt to flee, triggering a free attack for anyone surrounding him. Alternatively, if they cannot move back, they skip a turn. Remember to never leave your troops alone with multiple enemies and try to put at least two on each enemy. Now, let's take a quick look over the stat attributes. Each character has offensive points, used for attack, counterattacking, spells and skills. Each character also has strategy points, used for walking around and several skills. The other stats stand for damage mitigation, called armor absorption, melee or ranged damage, depending which weapon you chosen or carry, your crit chance, and your health points, they're called in this game Wounds. First, the physical skill. Strength is the primary skill for melee warriors, unless making a tank. It should also be the primary skill for two-handed weapon wielders. Every three strengths grants an extra inventory slot. Toughness is the primary skill for meat shields, aka tanks, and make them incredibly hard to kill. For example, my zombie henchman has more health than my leader. Health is called Wounds in wartime, and there are also open wounds which can lead to permanent injuries in combat. Frontline units should focus on toughness. Agility is the primary skill for casters and ranged units. Unless situational, situations occur, like for example the undead ghouls. They can't wear armor or shields, and you can make them incredibly dodgy, making them in turn actually viable frontline units. It increases dodge by an impressive 5% per point. Then let's go to the mental skills. Leadership is morale and psychological tests. This is situational. For Undead, I rarely have to level it since most troops have Last Stand and Unwavering, so are already immune. For morale, it doesn't really matter. You'd want the troops that are least likely to fall early to have the high morale, so you don't rout easily. Think about ranged casters. However, if you are not immune to fear, fear is the most annoying check you can have. As most impressives and enemy heroes, especially Undead and Cult of the Possessed, will force your frontline troops to do a fear check which if you fail can easily decimate your frontline without being able to do much damage. So for most warbands, leadership is a very high priority. Intelligence has a special meaning to me, but it's usually important for casters. My rule is to give everyone at least three intelligence, and this is for a special skill I teach nearly all my troops, called Knowledge Tactics. A hero unit or a buff can also upgrade the skill. This will require 9 intelligence. The skill increase dodge and parry by 15% and most of my heroes get this skill. Thus also 9 intelligence. The most useful boost in this attribute itself is a stun resistance. Alertness is somewhat weak in my eyes unless initiative plays a big role. It helps units to get their turn faster and increase some ranged resistance. Usually getting hit by ranged occurs much less than getting hit by melee though. 
Martial skills are very important skills. Weapon skill is the must level for every unit holding a melee weapon. All stats it's increased are very vital for frontline units. 4% parry chance and 2% hit chance make this the best skill of all, as hitting attacks is more important than anything else. Ballistic skill is solely for ranged units. Accuracy should have had the hit chance in my book, but becomes the second to go for the most units. Other stats are already described above, it shows dodge, parry, mental and leadership stats. Dodge and parry are twins of a different father. Dodge comes from agility and parry comes from weapon skill. In combat, for defensive measures to end your turn, unless you take an offensive stance or don't have enough strategy points, you always put units in either parry or dodge chance. So for every unit you want to make a choice to max out one of the two stats. Every sword, or for two-handed halberd and staves, or shield wielding units can go into a parry stance. For resistances, it's important to know that for the top resistance, the percentage depict the chance you resist the incoming damage type, not the amount it mitigates. This means if my poison globally hits one of my zombies, or I ambush myself through it, which never happens, the chance it doesn't affect me are above medium, since the poison resistance is so high due to toughness. Well, in this case it's a bad example, because the zombies are immune to poison effects, so won't have much problems running through them, but you get the idea. On the right side, you see the unit proficiencies and perks. Proficiency states what weapon and armor you can use with a specific unit and are self-explanatory. Perks can make a real difference in war and training. Vampires are immune to all leadership tests, so technically won't benefit from leadership. This also counts for all other troops in the undead army. That means they can focus on intelligence and alertness, while having minor impact on the morale if taken out. The poison Globadier is also immune to poison due its gas mask. Just like most undeads, since they are all immune, they team exceptionally well together. Henchmen in the undead army have the last stand pack, which is quite hard, as they cannot retreat. That means positioning becomes even more important, however do it also gives the all alone check, it becomes a very safe and reliable unit to even stand alone against many enemies. If your unit or enemy dies in combat, it doesn't really die, but it has to do an injury check at the end of the battle. This can cause injuries and of course also perma death. The worst injuries are mental and limb loss. A ghoul can do fine with one arm, but an archer would be completely useless. Also legs missing disables the possibility to, for example, climb. Most injuries might not affect you too much and may even become beneficial and give you skill points. Zombies have skills that reduce the chance for most injuries, but they have a higher chance to be permanently destroyed when falling in battle. They will also decay if not paid upkeep properly. Let's take a look at the skills and the spells, and for that let's go back to the Necromancer, to show you a little bit about skills and spells. Casters are unique, as in they can learn spells, but also skills. All characters can learn skills, but only heroes, leaders and impressives can upgrade skill. The Necromancer also has a skill called Combat Savvy, which buffs damage resistance from frontline units. For now I still have to upgrade it, and we will talk about skills later. He also has several spells, including an upgraded lifesteal. The Necromancer is level 6 and has 7 points of each offensive and strategy points. If he is standing behind my frontline, he can cast 2 combat savvies and 2 lifesteals. Or if he is in an unsafe situation, he can do 1 combat savvy and a dodge and a parry, with an extra offensive point left to counterattack. All characters have a small but increasing chance to counterattack when attacked and will always counterattack when parrying successfully, as long as they have at least one offensive point. This same thought process is also early on really important. A low level leader has 5 points. That is 2 hits with a 2 handed weapon, because a 2 handed weapon has a passive skill called tiring, which means it costs more offensive points if used repeatedly in one turn. Or if I would build this leader as a tank, I could give him a shield and a one-handed weapon, he'd have two attacks and one counterattack point for parry stance. If a low-level melee unit would have three points, he'd most likely get a two-handed weapon or a shield and a one-handed one to parry. If a unit has four points in offensive, if he can have a two-handed that can parry, he will get that, but he most likely gets a one-handed so he can do two hits and on five points, again, either two-handed or a one-handed plus shield. On high level, both my leader and hero have 9 offensive points, which is 4 attacks for the one-handed weapon, plus 1 for counter-attacking. If for example the vampire leader and the vampire troll 
will start clobbering you with maces. That would be a total of 8 attacks and you are bound to squeeze a crit or a stun in there. Personally, I rarely focus on active skills, also because of that tactic. If I would do a jaw strike, for example, I would be quite useful on fighting a caster, but mainly it would cost me an extra offensive point for no reason, losing an entire attack. Passive skills, however, always apply and really work in increasing your survivability without extra cost in strategy and offensive points. A good example would be the combat savvy, but you have to remember some skills cannot be cast when you're engaged. So that would nullify the effect of it, but you could potentially cast it just before you go in. This skill gives a very good boost to not getting hit. See it as enemy hit chance minus melee resistance is true hit chance. So for skills, every stat to the left, for example strength, has both active and passive skills. For example, strength skills are often focused on doing more damage and impact, but usually at the cost of extra offensive points, which actually might in the end be less damage, because you can do one attack less, for instance. For strength passive skills, there may be useful skills like armor proficiency. If you want to put your hero or leader in heavy armor, you can still make sure they can walk really far. Toughness skills are ideal for your frontline. For example, the passive skills will ensure that your troops really have much more resistance. The active skills are usually pretty bad because you will lose health to restore a strategy point or to restore an open wound or to have increased stats, which is not really beneficial. The active skills for agility are some of the better ones. For example, the sidestep will make sure you have two attempts to dodge instead of one. The passive skills, again, are much more interesting as they cost nothing and they just increase your stats. The active skills for leadership are one of the best you can get. For example, Intimidate will force your enemy to flee and you can use it while being engaged. The passive skills can be somewhat useless only if your character benefits from that. The active skills from Intelligence are one of the better ones in game, but they are pretty much nullified by the fact that you have to be not engaged. So you could use them just to prepare before going in, but afterwards you can't really use them anymore if you are already engaged with an enemy. The intelligence passive skills are some of the better ones. The most interesting intelligence passive skill is actually to increase your henchman to a hero. However, please remember, your henchman may be a hero, but you have to put him in a hero slot as well, so it can't remain in the henchman slot. Of course, then he can actually learn upgraded skills as well. Intelligence passive skills also have the skill I use the most, knowledge tactics, which I learned to almost all my chars. The other passive skills for intelligence usually pertain to increased general stats, like movement, resistance to weirdstone, resistance to trap, etc. The alertness active skills are somewhat bad, actually, because most of them you cannot be engaged again, and they just give minor buffs, and they also go at the cost of your dodge of parry stance. The passive skills, however, will literally boost your characters a lot. For example, melee resistance, upgraded, you have 10% extra and do not get hit, which is really interesting. And weapon skill actually does have some of the better active skills. For example, Onslaught I use on one of my heroes, and it really works a lot. For example, Onslaught works really well because you get extra parry chance and it actually makes your ambush viable because you know you have the defense then to not get murdered right after. And the same counts for Web of Steel, which is a good replacement for the parry stance itself. You will make sure you have a double parry stance attempt, which is ideal. The weapon skill, passive skills are somewhat subpar to other passive skills and will give you only small bonuses. The reason for this is they apply usually bonuses to actions that may not even happen in a fight or rarely happen. The ballistic skill active skills are some of the more interesting ones because you can reduce the melee hit chance or reduce the maximum offensive points so you can make sure that the enemy actually does less in combat which is definitely worth the shot or the extra offensive points. The passive skills also give small bonuses to ranged characters, which are quite interesting, not overly though. Active accuracy skills give you small bonuses to your hits, but usually come at a high cost. However, if you, for example, manage to do a headshot successfully, you will stun the enemy and the benefit actually far outweighs the negative effect of the less hit chance and the extra cost. Accuracy passive skills are actually pretty good. They give strong bonuses to very vital stats like hit chance, or bypassing dodge and parry chance. Then the most active ones and some that are most likely to be taken, especially when it comes to active skills, are your race specific skills. 
For example, the undead have dead stench, which can be cast while being engaged, which is really strong. Or dead trap, which will cost you actually offensive points, which is negative. So dead stench would be better because when you are engaged, you actually know you have the spare strategy points. All the races have completely different skills, which are really interesting and usually are the best ones to take. Passive skills can be very decent, but usually, and for race specific active skills are the most interesting, well, passive skills may fall a little bit short in comparison. Now let's talk about money. For example, the shop. Luckily, money may be a problem early on, but once you start selling enchanted gear, you'll find on the streets money really comes pouring in. Enchanted gear will be found on enemies a lot on higher levels and can sell for 25 to 200 gold easily, depending on the quality. Veteran skills and levels will boost this even more. Every week the shop is refreshed with new items, but it's mainly used for selling. With the exception of health potion and early weapons, buying is uh, somewhat of a rare occurrence. Eventually, on higher levels, you start finding enchantments more and more, mostly in chests for the mark itself, but also enchanted gear and drops and rewards. Once you find a formula, you can permanently keep using it all the time for a small cost. For example, epic formulas can give massive boots to your strats when enchanted onto the gear. On higher levels, you can also start hiring higher level mercenaries. This might seem expensive, but this cost is actually mitigated by the fact that you can freely buy skills for this unit for every skill point the unit has. Advice is for especially the impressive to buy it at a higher level, since you can only recruit it once your warband is already quite leveled up. And bringing a level 0 along, especially in exchange for two level 5 to 7 heroes, it's just a recipe for disaster. Every now and then a new wordstone request comes in, and you are expected to pay tribute in the form of a wordstone weight to one of the factions in the smuggler den. You will have around 10 days to complete the requests, which can be increased by reputation and veteran skills. Higher reputation gives very strong rewards like free high level units, enchantments and items, so it's most definitely worth to invest, mainly because selling weirdstone brings in a bulk of your gold income. And then we have campaigns. The system works with days. Every day you can do one campaign provided your leader is not wounded or learning skills. Every passing day skills are being learned, wounds are being healed and the campaign map is being refreshed. The campaign map can have two types of campaigns, the normal missions and the acts. The acts are very large adventurous events with massive rewards and great for leveling up troops. The normal campaigns are smaller maps with a straightforward goal, obliterate the enemy. The normal campaigns also always have a bonus objective and completing this will give you 3 more experience per unit, which is often double the experience you already get, plus several good bonus items. The easiest type of bonus objectives are get a weird stone and collect objective enemy trophies. Completed. Especially early on, it's very important to pick the right campaigns. That does not only count for bonus objectives, but mostly on the title and the description. Avoid missions like the Haunter in the Darkness. The description clearly states that you are both dispersed and scattered around, which means you will land smack in the middle of the enemies. Focus on campaigns like Scavengers and Versions of Dread, so you are sure you start a little apart from each other and you have time to organize your troops. You can send scouts to look for better locations. Normal and hard campaigns are usually both doable, so avoid any other missions. However, if you are really confident, higher ranked missions will give you more experience. Do you want to do a skirmish? That is PvP against real players. I've never done it myself, so I cannot advise it, but maybe we'll do it when my warband is completely maxed out. I did watch other YouTubers do it and it does give some extra depth to it, but matchmaking might be brutal. So make sure you know the game through and through. I am going to give you several samples and we'll start with some low level missions. I will make some mistakes to point out what not to do and what will actually be good things to do. So I created this market family a while ago, a cult of the possessed warband with a very strong distinct lust for financial growth. My goal is always to not have any casualties and to help accomplish this I will give them a biography and I usually stop playing the warband when even one of them gets wounded or dies. Since it's a financial family, all veteran skills are all aimed at making money or reducing costs. I look for a mission but I can't find a normal one so I have to send my scouts. Luckily a scavenger pops up which is the safest bet so I choose launch and deploy since I always want to put my man correctly onto the battlefield. Marked for death, Explore as a bonus objective, is a bit of a coin flip. Sometimes the enemy routes before the correct persons are even in sight, but overall one of the easiest objectives to complete. First thing, middle mouse button. I need to see the map. The map is exceptionally small, it's just one bridge between me and the enemy. I want to focus on securing the bridge head, if I can place my archers correctly I'm good to go. There are buildings 
at the head that are perfect for this situation. You can scout around freely and pick your strategy points back up. I call those actually blue pips and the offensive points I call red pips. You can then just go the other direction. You can pretty much run around until you interact with anything or anything interacts with you. Think about looting, traps, climbing, getting an overwatch shot on you or casting a skill. Near the bridge I can go weapons of destruction which gives me a 10% hit chance, 10% armor negation and 20% damage for one turn. But I don't need to do that yet because I won't encounter any enemies this fast. I can also go into ambush, which is risky because if someone comes in range, you do get a free attack, but the enemy can still attack you and you cannot benefit from an active dodge or parry chance. I stop walking with two strategy pips left, for the dodge. In regards to the ambush, you use this to make sure enemies don't break through your lines. If you stand in front and dodge chance, they will completely ignore you and run past you. To help you understand this, the higher level you become, the less I actually use my ambush. Because the enemy can maybe attack me even up to 4 times. If I'm in ambush, that's 4 attacks against me without an active dodge or parry chance. You can attack once freely with a bonus damage buff of 50%, but sometimes it's just not worth it. I move my archers inside the buildings to watch the bridge. When I want to place my hero near my leader, I run into a trap called Disorienting Veil which is 25% less dodge and parry chance for a while. You can actually press the B button to cycle through stats. Then you will see it will take 3 turns. With negative values like that, I want to keep him back a bit. An ambush chance will become the only viable option. As I walk towards their card, I can clearly see their starting point, but not a single soul nearby. I hesitate to push forward too much, getting to their card would be highly beneficial though. If I can steal their idol, that would break their morale a lot. Morale is shown on the top left. You see a red bar and a blue bar. The blue bar is yours. The red bar is the enemy. Every unit has certain morale value. Leaders often more than henchmen. If they fall out of action, morale drops. If morale drops below the line with a value on the bottom of the bar, they have to do a route check every turn. If that fails, you win. It looks like I moved forward too far. Their boss can get to me without me hitting a single overwatch shot. Luckily my leader has 55% dodge and he misses. Their leader is dual wielding, but he can only do one attack. And every leader starts with 5 offensive points, which normally would mean you can do 2 attacks with a dual wield or a two handed weapon. However, if you do a charge attack, your first attack doesn't cost 2, but three offensive points, which means you can't calculate the tiring effect of your weapons into a next hit and can only do one hit. In this situation, a charge attack would be less beneficial. I don't rush in, but I hold everyone back, as this is way too deep in enemy territory to be able to use my archers. Assuming I can disengage with my boss, I was wrong. The way I positioned my boss means I cannot disengage, because I cannot move backwards. That means I'm instantly in deep trouble as I already expected to be able to disengage. The chaos is instantly there. I should have never put my boss out of the overwatch range of my archers, and all good intentions are gone. I quickly move my hero in range to try to trigger an all alone check. But leaders have a high leadership usually, so the all alone check fails. Well, succeeds for him. Hits, misses, and eventually both losing leaders occurs. Once I get to that card, I find one more enemy near the card, the enemy fails an all alone check, normally he would attempt to flee. This means I get a free attack with each adjacent unit, but because he can't move back, he only skips his turn. Failing an all alone check results into losing your offensive points. Once back in the camp, I have to pay for my leader's treatment, who could have been dead, but instead has a mysterious ailment. Then I have to pay for the warband, they must be paid after every fight. If you would not fight for one day, you don't have to pay them. The mysterious ailment is a debuff that won't go away anymore. He lost 10 health points, which is painful, but no reason to delete the warband. The lesson for this fight is you can never be too careful. Despite all good intentions, I placed my leader way too far ahead of the troops and he got taken out because of it. The reason I could recover from that was because they only had one extra unit in range and I had six in range. Small areas can be useful, but if you set yourself against a wall, you can be in deep, deep trouble. This warband has a lot of archers, and that's on purpose, but early archers are somewhat weak. They can shoot only once and don't have skills to hit often, unless you know what to do. For archers, positioning is key. 
There are several ways to increase your archers' chances for success. Actually, your archers can't even miss in some situations. Stand on higher ground. This will increase your chance to hit. If you would stand below an enemy, this will lower your chance to hit. Another way is enemies that are not engaged are much easier to hit. Since enemies are often in ambush stance, you can hit them almost freely because they are not dodging or parrying. Then you have the aim skill. You can add two strategy points to aim a shot, yielding a 20 chance bonus. And let me give you a beautiful example in my second mission. The second mission I have an amazing fortified position and I win easily because my archers, including my leader, can severely weaken the enemy before they even get close. Despite fighting the toughest enemy you can encounter early on, the undead. I win without any friendlies out of action. Undead leaders and heroes are vampires and they cause terror to anyone engaged with them. Low level units have terrible leadership and often can't attack due failing the fear check. Only heroes and leaders may get hit off, and luckily my hero succeeded his fear check and managed to do much damage to the leader. And let's see what archers can do in the next mission as well. This is the act campaign, the very first one for the cult of the possessed. I instantly spot a hero on top of the wall, and when she comes down I ensure all my archers are ready. Since she is in ambush stance, I can freely hit her even when not having the high ground. I place my melee frontline in such a way that she can't get to the archers, but also can't charge my melee warriors by placing them somewhat behind obstacles. The charge range of a hero is most definitely a lot further than the ambush range of a henchman, and charge can nullify the ambush stance. While the archers got her to low health, when her next turn occurs, she gets ambushed by one of my heroes and dies. Ambush has a lower hit chance, but does have more damage to the surprised bonus. Since she isn't in dodge chance or parry chance, this is still a very high chance for success. The hero finished her off in one hit and no damage was done at all by the enemy hero. Every act you get a very strong friendly superhero called Persona Dermatis, which will help you a lot. Unlike high level warbands, low level warbands are having a much harder time and are much less reliable and are highly prone to RNG backfiring. Therefore you have to move slowly, plan out every move and calculate your mischance. The archers can rarely miss if you follow the three rules above, but can only shoot once at first and have a very low damage. Leveling them up to have four offensive points is a very high priority. Since I made my leader archer 2 when needed, I ensure I have two more ranged shots. When not engaged, I can focus on buffing my frontline and finishing up with an overwatch stance. The first campaign is quite tough, clearing the ground floor isn't much of a problem, but the enemy sends waves of three henchmen at a fast rate as soon as a number of troops have died. The last objective is on the top floor, but is guarded by their personae dramatis. This enemy is extremely strong, and since I already lost quite some health on my own personae dramatis, I can't really take her out easily. I use my heroes to get free hits on her, while sacrificing my henchmen to tank most hits. Heroes can hit once and then disengage, especially when they are low health, they remain very useful. Low level RNG also hits the enemy of course, because their superhero stuns herself while casting a spell. Spellcasters have a good chance to curse themselves, while casting any form of curse, spell or buff. This can even render them out of action, and I managed to complete the objectives but the losses are great. When friendly units get taken out they have to roll for injury. This can be a permanent debuff, handicap or even death, however this can also be a buff. One of my heroes got killed in the encounter, another henchman got megalomania, which increased the cost of ranged weapons and spells. Not really a problem, since it's a melee henchman. The third one was much more lucky, since he leveled he got his first mutation, but also a near death experience, granting him a free skill point. In a way it's not a problem when early on you lose units, because you will not have much invested in them. They are level 0, 1 or 2 and you can easily replace them and level that up in a few campaigns. Now high level campaigns are a whole different story. You know very well what your units can and cannot do and thus the entire gameplay becomes much more slow faced and much more reliable. I will switch to my high level warband and for this map I will focus on AoE combat, which I make sure backfires regularly on myself as well. I noticed two weirdsome rushes, but the, the maps are terrible. Hunters and prey would split up my troops, which I prefer not to, and horrors of more time are a recipe for disaster. After some scouting I find a good mission, called scavengers again, with a doable bonus objective. My strongest heroes are training and my impressive is still low level, so the mission is going to be very hard. I bring both my ranged heroes to ensure a high damage output. The map is small, which is risky, and the enemy is undead just like me, which is fine since my warriors are immune to their terror. 
I see a high point, which I can use for my ranged, but it will take a few turns to get there. My ghouls have maxed out dodge and my frontline maxed out parry. I try to position my troops as good as possible. For example, I place my archer somewhere in a hallway and I put a zombie in ambush stance a little bit in front of it. Unfortunately, their impressive is in my camp in two turns and despite hoping the zombie intercepts the impressive, the impressive gets to my archer because his charge range triggered before the ambush did. I use my poison globe here to cover their engagement point in poison and also try to poison their impressive, but he resists. Zombies may be immune, but ghouls are not. And when I engage the impressive with a ghoul, I poison my ghoul instead. Poison globes are game changers, but only cast them where the enemy is coming from or after an engaged frontline has been established. That means after all your troops are positioned and won't move, and then you can freely poison them. My archer has horrible initiative, partly on purpose because I don't want him to go first, so he is now blocking my impressive and zombie to get to theirs. I delay my impressive until the archer can go before him. I then shoot the enemy and throw an oil bomb, hitting my own poison globulier who was behind a wall. Unlike poison, fire does take the full impact radius even with a wall in between. My impressive can now move into range and hits the enemy impressive three times successfully and brings it to half health. Their impressive is worth two heroes and is very high level. It can hit my goal four times and do his insane weapon skill, hits a 95% dodge goal four times successfully. Despite the goal being worth sacrificing to bring down a high level impressive, but a single dodge would have just saved his life. I prepare the other half of my team to intercept new enemies. All this time I haven't moved far away from my card. One of my ghouls gets positive buff from a wall entity, giving him a 15% initiative for 3 turns. It isn't much of a real serious buff because he can just go faster but doesn't give any other bonuses. My ghoul that would have died already on poison managed to dodge 2 attacks from the incoming hero, which is quite a bonus. And I finish off their impressive without much more trouble. Having fast units is always a handicap for the enemy team, as they split up too much to be impactful in fights. I finish off their hero without taking any further damage. His loot is very useful gear, if only for selling as they are all enchanted. Making money is a lot easier on high level. Enemy troops are approaching and their leader stands ready in ambush stance. I use my dodgiest goal to trigger the leader's ambush stance, which enables me to swarm him with my troops. Since he hasn't used any offensive points, he can counterattack several times, which will really hurt. My zombies have better weapon skill than my ghouls and have a lot less trouble hitting their leader. Their necromancer appears and does terrible AoE damage on my team. I make sure their necromancer is engaged so he doesn't focus on casting spells. I finish off all enemies in the next turn and loot their corpses. Their leader, as most leaders will, drop very high epic enchanted gear. My ghoul makes a full recovery and my impressive gets bonus experience for being the most valuable. Highest damage will give one experience and every kill give one experience too. I never encountered the enemies I had to kill for the bonus objective so I'm missing out on 3 experience for that. The morale of this fight is AoE poison and fire through for example oil bombs can speed up a battle but it can also backfire a lot. For poison you often barely see the border, for fire you think you can sneak past a narrow area or you must loot their boss's corpse and before you know it you are on fire or having a poison effect yourself. Also spellcasters can often do AoE damage but can also hurt their own troops in the process. Well this brings my warband to level 9 which increases the weird stone resistance and most importantly the all alone tests. Undead warbands have a massive advantage early on but on higher levels their terror will barely work. The items found can be sold for a few hundred gold. The shield I prefer to keep, even though the enchant is not overly interesting. Comparing the epic with the rare shield does give a very good view on how much better higher quality gear actually is. The dagger I give to my ambush goal to now have two similar daggers to Shankala. Daggers have low damage but like spears are quick and nimble, thus their hit chance increases are pretty well enhanced. Over time your warriors will accumulate injuries, especially when they fall out of action but usually have little impact, unless limbs start to fall off. Therefore, despite not having lost a single troop in this warband, I do have several backups, somewhat leveled up and I always try to bring a mix of top fighters and some low units. I have just enough weirdstone to level up my reputation, which will give me an enchantment pack, getting to max reputation will be hard, but not undoable, and grants high level impressive and leader. Getting, getting reputation with the other factions will enable you to hire heroes from other races, like Skaven. 
The next act is actually already available for the Undead Warband, but I've played the previous act and it was really hard. So I don't want to do it until my impressive is higher level. So currently I'm just grinding on normal campaigns. Next day the market stocks replenished, which doesn't provide anything useful, but I do notice it now sells enchanted gear as well. The next mission is Rivals in the Runes, which is quite safe and crush their will objective. Since I have been failing so badly on bonus objective, this will be my focus now. I want to bring more power, so bring max levels with the exceptions of a zombie, a ghoul and the impressive. Rivals in the Runes is not ideal for the bonus objective, since you can't spawn a runner near their camp, but we'll see how it goes. Since the enemy will be most likely focused on looting, which is mainly available in the southeast if I check the map. So I will use the northwest route to get to their cart. I set two markers, one for the team, which has some loot on that position as well, and one for the runner, which is my poison globadier as he is the fastest. I will keep poison on and near me, this helps keep him a little bit more safe since the hero is immune to the effects himself. The enemy are the sisters of Sigmar and I'm actually quite weak against their evil smiting attacks. It doesn't take long before the first enemy presents himself and despite putting my front goal in dodge chance, the same goal as previous match, his dodge capabilities fail horrible again. Luckily he can counter attack twice and most of my weapons are enchanted with dismay causing their all alone fear and terror chests to lower. I can quickly dispose of enemies but if I go too fast, once I steal their idol their morale will fall too fast and they will rout. If I want to make the bonus objective happen, I cannot make them round, so I have to fight slowly. My vampires are equipped with maces and they can attack 4 times, one handed and with a 50% chance to stun. This occurs pretty often. I try to pin each enemy down with at least 2 friendly units. My best goal now shows Pyotr how to actually dodge, which is refreshing. And the first enemy already drops 2 epic enchanted weapons, which explains the hit chance and damage along. The runner is almost at the cart, but run into a few dead ends and is very close to an enemy. Eventually I make it to the cart and steal their idol. It's imperative that they don't fall below the routing threshold now. The liberator's boon buff will give you movement speed, which will help you get back fast. Their leader attacks from behind, but I already kept two zombies there for this reason. And once my impressive starts pummeling her, the fight is quickly over. This is another advantage of high level games. Enemies often miss limbs, which eases the suffering for your team a little bit. I pull my wounded zombie and go back. They did do their part. My leader is engaged with one of their heroes who actually gives up quite a fight. The most intense battle of the match is the one with their impressive though. My warrior troll hero is quite wounded and even though I do trust her defensive capabilities, I am worried regardless. Her onslaught skill enables her stance to get two parry attempts and counterattack, which is very useful against the impressive. But so are the skills of the impressive. I surround her with two zombies and eventually place my best goal behind her. When I can finally place the idol in the chest, I can finish off the hero engaged with my leader and drop their morale. This causes them the route for a decisive victory with no out of actions. I spend some time in the camp once the Weirdstone money comes in. I have 2000 to burn, which I got from the Weirdstone money, and I spend all on training every unit I have. For example, my leader got tons of skill points at max level and can get a lot stronger if I learn him more and more skills. But since I only have one leader, I can't easily swap him out and I have to sit in the camp for days to wait for his learning to be done. I focus as always on passive skills and buff skills. I teach my poison hero to also throw buff globes, which can help boost the team. The morale of this fight is actually that if you want to do bonus objectives, you have to build your entire fight to serve that bonus objective. You have to carefully calculate which enemies you can defeat and you have to make decisions to not kill enemies even though you already can, just to give your objective a chance to be completed. The last fight is how I normally play with my Undead Warband, and not specifically as a decisive victory that this was, but how enemies come to you. As a rule, the larger the map, the easier the fight. I create a defensive position in an alley and use my poison hero to fortify our position. I see the leader very nearby from the very start. I have the whole team together, so I'm not worried. And the entire match, one by one, the enemies pour in while I make quick work of the ones arriving. These are by far the easiest matches as they're always the safest way to win. Just stay put at your card and wait for the enemy. The entire match I focus on finishing the kills with my impressive to give him more experience. I had two perfect fights this match. One was my vampire troll hero got attacked, she parried and dodged everything with the help of onslaught and she could then actually counterattack several times in the turn of the enemy and when her turn came, she cleared the remaining health in one turn. The other one, one of my zombies was positioned very badly from the start 
And I can't rendezvous with my team since zombies are, well, slow. Enemies are too close by to get him out of there, so I position him on a stairwell. I have used this tactic several times to ensure he may not get out, but he will be engaged by most one versus one, as they can't get behind him or place multiple enemies on him. This fight actually went extremely well. The zombie dodged and parried everything, and with a little help from a friend, he killed the enemy unit without taking much damage himself. That specific unit and two other normal henchmen units were actually the objective. So for once, I completed the objective before the enemy routed. After the fight, my impressive also leveled as the four kills on his name did help boosting him a lot. The morale of this story is of course, let the enemy come to you. Don't start looking for the enemy, because if you are too far split up, you can actually not bring your group together fast enough to be overrun by the enemy. Now, usually when playing games, it starts easy and becomes harder and harder. In a way, more time is the opposite. Your troops become much more reliable and your fights take longer to higher defenses and help us. This enables you to react before units fall out of action and have more time to assign more or less reinforcements to certain areas on the battlefield. Money is a big problem early on, but on higher levels and with higher veteran skills, every battle becomes a gold mine. For example, selling enchanted weapons will be another source of your income and witchstones pay much more. Thanks to that you can eventually hire heroes instead of training them from level zero. I want to do the act campaign, but you haven't seen what I've seen. The horrors of the previous campaign still freshly haunt my nightmare. The Undead Act campaign is much different than the usual maps and has high enemies that will drive you nuts. You fight horrors you've never seen before. The succubi are almost undefeatable and the horrors split into multiple when killed. I don't want my first defeat on the warband, so my impressive must be high level before I will. Mordheim City of the Damned is, is a passion game for me. I love coming back and I love making a new warband and I love yelling at everything that goes wrong with early warbands. But once you have one warband at higher level, you really start to adore the game. The grand versatility of skills, the in-depth combat system and everything is absolutely enjoyable. And that's why I recommend it to everyone. Thank you for watching and I hope this masterclass will help you a little bit. Get back to the